Okay, welcome back, brothers and sisters. Um, shall we begin with a word of prayer? Amen. <clears throat> okay, the, over the next few presentations, we're going to talk about this um, subject of the Omega apostasy. Now, <clears throat> you could probably do ten presentations on this subject. It's so deep. There's so many different facets to cover in it, but I'm going to do three presentations on this, and I'm only giving you an overview so that you understand what it is, right? So, the omega. Um, the omega is the, the, is the last letter in the Greek alphabet. It means, basically, the omega apostasy, apostasy means the last apostasy. And, therefore, it's demonstrated by the first apostasy. And the first apostasy took place in heaven. So part of understanding the Omega apostasy is understanding what happened in heaven. And now we've already been through some of this. When we went through these four abominations, we were showing you how the devil is going to deceive people at the end of time because this is how he deceived um, the angels in heaven and this is how he's been deceiving mankind all the way through time. So the Lord has already shown you how the, dis the devil is going to deceive us at the end of the world through these principles. But we're going to now look at how the, this omega apostasy, how is it going to manifest itself? How, what's it going to look like? Right? So you're able to recognize it. Let's, let's begin by <clears throat> going to uh, Matthew chapter 24. This is the, this great rundown of events at the end of the world that was prefigured by many things that happened back in the <coughs> time of the literal Jews and then went down through history leading us down to the end of the world. In Matthew chapter 24 and verse 3 it says, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? So they're asking, when are you coming, and when's the end of the world? These are two, two questions, and they're actually two different uh, points in time. But Christ starts to relay these two different points, and that's what you have to understand. In Matthew 24... Luke 13 and, and uh, sorry, Mark 13 and Luke 21. He's actually talking about two different points in time. But in verse 4 it says, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Right? So the very first thing Christ does is to answer that question about when's the sign of your coming and when's the end of the world is he says, in fact, let's just do it on here. He says, many will come and deceive many. So many are going to deceive many, right? That's quite frightening, right? That should put the fear of God in our hearts and put us on our guard. Because he, you know, they're asking him this question. The very first thing he answers is this. Take heed that no man deceive you. 
For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. So, the word Christ, what does the word Christ mean? The anointed one, right? So, it's very interesting that in this movement, at this moment in time, okay, and I say this movement, even though there's two messages making up this movement, it says this because the wheat and tares are to grow together until the harvest. Therefore, it's one movement, two messages, and you must discern which is the right message within this movement, right? Because God says the wheat and tares will grow together till the harvest. So you can't separate these two thoughts. They've developed, and you must be able to recognize it. And within this movement, on one side, there are people that have been anointed, and they're claiming to be the anointed ones, right? So straight away, when you understand this, you already can begin to look and think, oh, that's interesting. And in verse 6 in Matthew 24, it says, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. So Christ is saying, when this many come and deceive many, and these many are the anointed ones, right? It says, when they come and do this, and also there's wars and rumors of wars, it says the end is not yet, right? That, that's the key that you have to, to see right here. Christ is saying, when these things come to pass, that's not the second coming. It's not yet. Because that's the question they've asked him. And then if you jump to verse 24 in Matthew 24, it says, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and, ye, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So these false Christs, and false prophets, they're going to show great signs and wonders. But the elect, they won't be able to deceive, right? Because Christ is going to protect them. It says, Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, He's in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he's in the secret chambers, believe it not. So where's the secret chambers? We, we've been through this already. Your heart. So if they're saying Christ is in the secret chambers, what are they saying? They're saying they're holy. They're saying that they have Christ in them, the hope of glory. But he's saying... If they say he's in the desert, the desert is also what? When Christ went into the desert, where did he go? Into the, the wilderness. And the wilderness is the 1260. And, and I know that Patrick has shown this, that this time period right here is a representation of 1260. From here to here is a wilderness, right? So it says that if Christ is in the desert or he's in the heart, Believe them not. Don't believe them. Because he said it's not yet. Other things have got to happen first. There's got to be wars and rumors of wars. And the, the devil is going to come and deceive. Now, I know also that he's been through this, this wilderness here. These, all these 40s that are all typifying what's going to happen here. But Christ was in the wilderness from his baptism for 40 days. And at the four, end of the 40 days, the devil came down to him and tempted him three times, right? And it tells us in Desire of Ages that when the devil, when he came down, he comes down as an angel of light. And an angel, what's another word for an angel? A messenger of light. Right? So it's not, it's, this is something natural demonstrated, something spiritual. 
So it's demonstrating that Satan or his doctrines are going to be manifested through messengers to claim to be Christ, right? See what we're saying? These false Christs, they're claiming to be the anointed ones and they're going to deceive many because they're doing the work of the deceiver. They're claiming to be Christ and they're going to be doing miracles, signs and wonders, right? And it's going to deceive you if you're not grounded on this understanding. For as lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So they're telling you, you can't counterfeit the second coming of Christ. The, 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 the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy are very, very clear. Does Christ come and put his feet on this earth? No, no, no he doesn't. No, no, he doesn't. He, when, when he, on his second coming, what does he do? He comes in the cloud with all his angels. They're going to meet him in the air, right? It's not until after the thousand years that he comes down and he puts his, says he puts his foot on the Mount of Olives and it cleaves it, right? It's something spiritual. But nonetheless, this is when, after the thousand years, is when the holy city comes down and earth is now going to be the center of the universe, right? Once everything's done and completed. But when he cut the second coming, he does not put his feet on this planet. It says, the Lord is very clear. He does not allow Satan to counterfeit this particular thing. So it's telling you that whatever their message is here, it's false signs and wonders. And it's their saying that it's the second coming of Christ. But he's saying, be not deceived, for the end is not yet, for all these things must first come to pass. Right? Wars and rumors of wars. And, and then it explains how the second coming of Christ is going to look like. Now we know that in type, for the priests, the second coming of Christ is here. And it's not his literal coming, it's something spiritual that we have to understand. It's where you become the church triumphant. It's where you have Christ in you, the hope of glory. But them saying that they have Christ in them here, the hope of glory, is a counterfeit. Can't be. Because the other day they were showing you no cross, no crown. Right? And the crown is the glory. Is the, is the point where you have become the church triumphant. And in verse 29 of Matthew 24, it says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days... What was the tribulation in history? 1260. The 1260 years, right? So it's already telling you this wilderness, this 1260 years, after the 1260 years, let's see what it says. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give a light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. What is that? Is that the shaking of the earth? Heaven. It's the shaking of the heavens and the earth. And I know that, I think Brother Clankla used this quote, and I might use it later on in one of my presentations. CET 111. Sister White talks about 1848. And <clears throat> when um, Brother Clankla also dealt with the 21st of February, 1848, it's shown that the 21st of February, 1848, marks here, marks when this and, and, and I will go much deeper into this later when the, the, uh, the king of France makes this allegiance with the Pope and it causes this great tumult across all of Europe. Okay? And she talks about that year, 1848. And she says it was not the shaking of the heavens and the earth. She says it was the shaking of the earth. It was the earthly kingdoms being shaken, not the shaking of the heavens and the earth. It's a separate event. And this is in line with what's been said here. You can show that in Matthew 24, Luke 21, and, and Mark 13, there's a shaking of the earth, followed by a shaking of the heavens and the earth. And the shaking of the heavens and the earth is Mount Sinai. And Mount Sinai is Pentecost, right? And shaking of the heavens and the earth is Christ's second coming, right? So she's distinctly marking these two points, the shaking of the earth by the shaking of the heavens and the earth. And it says 
After the tribulation of those days, after 1260, then is the shaking of the heavens and the earth. It's all symbols, and you have to bring them all together to understand it. And then it says in verse 30, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So he comes when the heavens and the earth are being shaken. Not when the earth is being shaken alone. Must understand this. Read CET 111.1. She explains it very, very clearly. Right? And then just look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke because she mentions Matthew, Mark, and Luke in that quote. Right? And you'll see that she's referring to the year 1848 where this great thing took place because the the king of France and the Pope made this allegiance. And it's just pointing to the end of the world. And she's pointing to it right here. So, now, let's read this quote. Now, I realize you don't have the notes because this was um, something I wasn't planning on doing, but... um, I don't know, maybe for the next one we can maybe email you them somehow. But anyway, I I will read and I'll try to read slowly so that you can follow along. It says, it's from Great Controversy, 624.2. It says, as the crowning act in the great drama of deception. Now just think about that, what I just said. As the crowning act in the great drama of deception. When are we given a crown? At the first step, the second step, or the third step? The third step, right? Now we know that Christ's crowning act was the raising of Lazarus. When are you raised out of your grave? First step, second step, or third step? The third step, right? So we know right here, prophetically, it's where you're raised out of your grave. It's where you become the church triumphant, right? And the raising of Lazarus when he raised Lazarus, right, the, 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 the stone was rolled away, right? When Christ was raised up, after how many days? Three days. What was rolled away? A, a stone, right? The, the raising up of Christ is just the same as the raising up of Lazarus. The two things, just as Christ is illustrating his people at the end of the world. So, and the raising of Lazarus was the crowning act. So Satan wants to counterfeit Christ's crowning act and he's going to do also this this crowning act but it's his deception, right? It says, as the crowning act in the great drama of deception, Satan himself will personate Christ. The church has long professed to look to the Savior's advent as the consummation of our hopes. Now, the great deceiver will make it appear that Christ has come. Now, I want to get, get a point right here. I'm just going to draw a parallel to this binding off because I know that it's been mentioned. When, when Christ is on the cross for three hours, right, you get to the ninth hour, so sixth hour is, is midday, becomes midnight darkness, and it's dark for these three hours. When he gets to the ninth hour, he says what? It is finished, right? When you get to the close of probation, what does he say? It is done. And Sister White has that quote where she says, it is done, it is finished. She, she lines them up. And it's something we have to understand because in this binding off for the priest, you have these three steps followed by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven plagues. And they're typifying the seven last plagues at the close of probation, right? And this is the work of Islam, and we're hopefully going to make this a bit clearer as we go through. So, this is one binding off, then you've got two binding offs, you've got three binding offs, you've got three people. So you've got three binding offs. One, two, three, followed by Christ saying, "It, it is done, right? I'll just put here close of probation. This would be the close of probation for the priests. So you see, you've got this parallel. You've got three steps, a close of probation, followed by seven last plagues in type. You've got three binding offs, a close of probation, followed by seven last plagues. So these are two fractals, right? 
Because God's dealing with man is, is ever the same. So, um, Satan's crowning deception where he's going to impersonate Christ is at the third step. It's at the third group. It's the Gentiles. Satan, right? God's people might be deceived in some ways. But no Seventh-day Adventist is going to buy Satan walking around this planet claiming to be Christ. At least I would hope not because we all understand uh, the, at least this truth that Satan, uh, sorry, Christ does not put his feet on the ground, right? If we just hold to that, can't be deceived by it. She says it very clearly in Great Controversy. So Satan has to deceive the priests and the Levites by some other means, right? Something that means the same, spiritually speaking, but it's a, it's a more deceptive way because God's people have the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy, they understand it correctly. He's not going to deceive them so easy by saying, I am Christ and talking nicely. They're going to go, no way, right? At least they should do. So he knows this. So this is the Gentiles. When you get to the Gentiles, his power is going to be even more. This is where he's going to do this last great deception. It's the crowning act. Just like the raising of Lazarus was the crowning act. So... Um, I want you to it says now the great deceiver will make it appear that Christ has come in different parts of the earth Satan will manifest himself among men as a majestic being of dazzling brightness resembling the description of the son of God given by John in the revelation now how is it that Satan can do that with the Gentiles you might not know the answer to that, but I just want to see. Maybe somebody's really switched on and, and can answer me that. How is it that he can do it with the Gentiles, but not with Seventh-day Adventists? At least, at least people that are understanding this message. Why? Because the Seventh-day Adventists have got the, mess, the knowledge of the message. Okay, and that's correct, right? But there's a principle. Okay, I'll give you, I'll give you a clue. What does 1 Corinthians 15, 46 teach? First comes the natural, followed by the... So, at the end of the world, are we looking for natural? I mean, all prophecy is going to be literally fulfilled by, by somebody. But are we looking for the... Like, are we looking for um, literal Babylon to fulfill the prophecy at the end of the world? No, it's spiritual Babylon, right? It's the entities of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And when we say a dragon, we don't mean a literal dragon, right? We know that it's something that's going to demonstrate Satan, right? It's his agents. So we understand this. So we're not looking for Christ to literally come in, our, in the time of the priests or in the time of the Levites. It's something spiritual. And what we are looking for is him to come into our hearts. That's how we know when Christ has come. When he comes and lives in us, that is the second coming of Christ for us. We become the church in heaven, right? So therefore, Satan knows that he's not going to deceive the priests and the Levites so easy. It's something spiritual that he's going to do. So he has to use a deception of the same thing that we would be looking for. So this is what I'm saying, that they're saying, behold, he's in the secret chambers. Believe it not. This is them marking that Christ has come, right? Whereas he's not in you until you get to this point. That's where you become the church triumphant, right? So it's, it's, it's the same truth, but it's different, right? Because it's prophetically teaching us uh, the same thing, but in a different way. So how is he going to do that? Well, we mentioned here that Satan came down to Christ and tested him three times as an angel of light. So let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Second Corinthians chapter 11. Verses 13 to 15. <clears throat> it says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, 
transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. So it's not a work that Christ is doing. This is a deceitful work. They're claiming to be the apostles of Christ. But let's look at it. It says, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. When does he do that? At his crowning act. He's going to transform himself into an angel of light. But prior to this, he says, These people who claim to be the apostles of Christ are transforming themselves into this, right? And he says, No marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness. So who is it that's coming as an angel of light? It's his ministers. It's his agents, right? Next quote. Councils to the Church, page 323.6. The experience of the past will be repeated. In the future, Satan's superstitions will assume new forms. Errors will be presented in a pleasing and flattering manner. False theories clothed with garments of light. So how does, how does Satan come to you as an angel of light? What, is it just, what did I just say? It's false theories clothed with garments of light. And remember, an angel, an angel of light is a messenger of light. And a messenger has what? A message. Whether it be a true message or a false message. And we're going to see that you can determine which one it is by their message. You have to be Bereans. You have to know that's a false message, right? So, the, 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 the theories that they present is Satan as an angel of light. It's clothed with garments of light. Will be presented to God's people. Thus, Satan will try to deceive, if possible, the very elect, right? So, Satan's going to deceive the very elect, that's God's people, through false theories, right? He's going to clothe them with a garment of light. It says, Corruptions of every type, similar to those existing amongst the antediluvians, will be brought in to take minds captive. The exaltation of nature as God, the unrestrained license of the human will, the counsel of the ungodly, these Satan uses as agencies to bring about certain ends. He will employ the power of mind over mind to carry out his designs. The most sorrowful thought of all is that under his deceptive influence, men will have a form of godliness without having a real connection with God. So he's going to use other people they are going to present his specious theories and they're going to be clothed with a garment of light. And if you accept them, right, you're now accepting this false message and you're going to fall to his deceptions. Like Adam and Eve, who ate the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, many are even now feeding upon deceptive morsels of error. Whoa. Whoa. Right? So, when this angel came down here at 9 11, the second angel, uh, are, we to, are we to eat something? Yes. Okay, when they went into, when the, when the, Egyptian, the Egyptians, when the Israelites came out of Egypt and went into, into the wilderness, right? They're in the wilderness for 40 years, right? So, in some sense, it's typified here, right? What was their first test? They crossed the Red Sea, and then the Lord, the manna test, right? And the manna is the bread that comes from heaven. Christ says, eat my flesh and drink my blood, or you have no life in you, right? He wants them to eat him. He is the word, right? So in August 11th, 1840, which parallels this in some sense, right? Did an angel come down with something in his hand? A little book. And what did they have to do with the little book? They had to eat it, right? 
and it was the messages of truth, right? So it's, Satan is going to come down. He's also going to give you a message. And he's saying, eat this, right? But this one is based upon your flesh. It's based upon, yeah, I like that. I like that because it appeals to me. Does the message of Christ appeal to people? No, because it requires a cross. It requires a crucifixion of the flesh. It's hard to be a Christian, right? Your flesh does not desire to walk the steps Christ walked in. It falls across to get that crown, right? So be careful when people come and give you these peace and safety, nice messages. You go, I like that. And you walk away feeling all good about yourself. Because it says when the Holy Spirit, when he's come, will do what? Of sin. So when you go to church and you walk away from church and you've not been convicted of your sin, who gave you that message that day? The devil gave you the message that day. It was one of his agents giving you a message of specious theories wrapped in a garment of light that made you feel all nice and good about yourself, right? That's the peace and safety message and that's what's going to catch you in a snare, right? Satanic agencies are clothing false theories in an attractive garb. It's attractive. It appeals to your flesh. Even as Satan in the Garden of Eden concealed his identity from our first parents by speaking through the serpent. Okay. These agencies are instilling into human minds that which in reality is deadly error. The hypnotic influence of Satan will rest upon those who turn from the plain word of God to pleasing fables. So the word of God convicts you of your sin, but pleasing fables are going to take you into Satan's snare. It is those who have had the most light that Satan most assiduously seeks to ensnare. Okay, so who's had the most light in this planet? Which group of people on the earth today has had the most light? Seventh-day Adventists. And the most of Seventh-day Adventists are in a dumb Laodicean condition and they don't know the truth. So, but God always has a remnant in his church, right? Always. That's what makes them his church. So, but nonetheless, the Seventh-day Adventist church is his church and they are the ones that have the truth. Whether or not the people in that church understand it, that's neither here nor there. He has freely given them the truth, Right? He knows that if he can deceive them, they will, under his control, clothe sin with garments of righteousness and lead many astray. I say to all, be on your guard. For as an angel of light, Satan is walking in every assembly of Christian workers and in every church trying to win the members to his side. I am bidden to give to the people of God the warning. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. So, how do you detail, uh, how do you tell who is this angel of light? Because it's people, right? Okay, this is what we have to look at. We're going to nail this down so at least you can understand this point. Now, next quote is from Christ Object Lessons 408. And we're going to look now at this point midnight, right? Because... I've put on here, right, this, this is God's uh, signature. He's the Alpha on the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. And we have this time period, this wilderness. At the end, end of the wilderness, Satan comes down. At the beginning of the wilderness, was there something that took place here in the form of spiritualism? At 9-11, was there spiritualism ma- manifested? Can we remember? I only did this a few days ago. How how was it manifested at 9-11 in the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Yeah, not just theology. Any any office that requires them to be a teacher in any form, right, 
had to take spiritual formation. And it was at 9-11, September 2001. They made this document and it was law within the church, right? So the spiritualism is manifest at the beginning and it's teaching us that spiritualism is going to be manifested at the end. This is just this principle, right? Spiritualism was manifested in heaven in the beginning. Spiritualism is manifesting itself at the end. This is the alpha and the omega. So all the alphas that go down through history are pointing to the omega. This is why I say all the stories of the Bible are all speaking about the end of the world. All the stories of the Bible are the alpha. If you want to understand the omega, go to the stories of the Bible. They're teaching you what's coming in the omega. Right? And the omega is not just something internally, it's something externally. Because the Sunday law is the omega apostasy. It's the rebellion that's going to take place in this world. But it's also going to be manifested internally. How do we know that? Because both the papacy and Judas is the son of perdition. Right? It's no accident that the son of perdition is the, the papal power. That's the external power. But internally, Judas is also the son of perdition. He's the pope within. And Martin Luther says the greatest fear is the Pope within our own hearts, right? This is the Pope that we need to conquer, right? In order to conquer that Pope out there. So, Christ Object Lessons 408, paragraph 3, uh, paragraph 2, sorry, then 3. It says, In the parable, all the ten virgins went out to meet the bridegroom. All had lamps and vessels for oil. For a time, there was seen no difference between them. So with the church that lives just before Christ's second coming. All having knowledge of the scriptures, all have heard the message of Christ's near approach and confidently expect his appearing. But as in the parable, so it is now. A time of waiting intervenes. Faith is tried, and when the cry is heard, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Many are unready. They have no oil in their vessels with their lamps. They are destitute of the Holy Spirit. So we went through this, the parable of the ten virgins. We know that it has an application here between 9-11 and midnight, and then it's going to be repeated at midnight perfectly with the group that enters in there. And it goes on to say, without the Spirit of God, a knowledge of His Word is of no avail. The theory of truth, unaccompanied by the Holy Spirit, cannot quicken the soul or sanctify the heart. One may be familiar with the commands and promises of the Bible, but unless the Spirit of God sets the truth home, the character will not be transformed. Without the enlightenment of the Spirit, men will not be able to distinguish truth from error, and they will falter or will fall under the masterful temptations of Satan. So you have to receive the word into your heart through the power of the Holy Spirit. If it's just a, a mental understanding, it's not enough. It has to be seeded in there through the power of the Holy Spirit, right? So uh, we, we have to understand that, how, how to do that. We've got to eat God's word. We've got to make it become part of us. So it goes on to say, Christ Object Lessons 412, it is in a crisis that character is revealed. When the earnest voice proclaimed at midnight, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him, and the sleeping virgins were roused from their slumbers, it was seen who had made preparation for the event. Both parties were taken unawares, but one was prepared for the emergency, and the other was found without preparation. So now a sudden and unlooked for calamity Something that brings the soul face to face with death will show whether there is any real faith in the promises of God. It will show whether the soul is sustained by grace. The great final test comes at the close of human probation when it will be too late for the soul's need to be supplied. So, many ways you can look at that. I'm not going too deep into that, but I just want to take some points. It says, here it says, it was seen who had made preparation for the event. The character is revealed at midnight. So, in the next quote from Great Controversy 625, we're going to take those points that we just looked at there, 
Great Controversy 625.3. Only those who have been diligent students of the scriptures and who have received the love of the truth will be shielded from the powerful delusions that take the world captive. So I'm going to read that again, right? Because that is vitally important that you understand that. So I'll, I'll stress the word only, right? That means it's categorizing you into a group. Only those who have been diligent students of the scriptures and who have received the love of the truth will be shielded from the powerful delusions that take the world captive. So that tells you, right, if you've not been a diligent student of Bible prophecy, you don't have a love for the truth, and you have a love for the world, you're gone. Right? Many are going to come, and they're going to deceive many. Right? It's all the way through the Bible. Many will come to me in that day and say, Lord, Lord. Many are called, but few are chosen. Many go through the wide gate, but only few find the narrow gate. Right? It should put fear in our hearts, brothers and sisters. Got to have that fear there. It says in Proverbs chapter 1 that the fear of the Lord is what? The beginning, the beginning of wisdom. And wisdom is an understanding of God's word, right? You've got to have the fear. This is why this message is designed to put fear in your hearts, to convict you of your sin or time wasting or or all these worldly things that we've been striving after all our lives and we're near the end of time so it's designed to show you where we are in time we were close designed to wake you up designed to convict you of your sin and make you realize your need that's what the Holy Spirit does if it doesn't do that it's not from God if you feel good feel like I'm a good Christian that's from the devil right he's deceiving you By the Bible testimony, these will detect the deceiver in his disguise. He's a disguised, right? He's disguised as an angel of light, as a messenger, right? So you're going to get people dressed like myself, use these chaps, they even write on a whiteboard. They claim to be God's end time anointed ones. You've got to recognize them. You can't take my word for it. You've got to recognize it by the means that the Lord has given us. To all, the testing time will come. So we know that the test is the image of the beast test. And it's to see whether you will bow down and worship the sun. And we know the devil's going to come down. He's going to say, no, no, I've changed Sabbath to Sunday. But how is he going to get you to do that? Because he's going to deceive you with so many sophistries, so many miracles and wonders, that if it were possible, he will deceive the very elect. But Satan himself is coming through his, his um, agents right here. You won't see him. They're going to look just like myself. It may, I may even be him. And the only way you're going to know that it's through God's word. It says, The testing time will come. By the sifting of temptation, the genuine Christian will be revealed. Are the people of God now so firmly established upon his word that they would not yield to the evidence of their senses? Right? I'm going to write that on the board. These are led by their Senses. These get deceived because of their senses. Like will be with like, right? Um, would they in such a crisis cling to the Bible and the Bible only? What did Christ do when he got tested three times right there? What did he say? It is written, it is written, it is written. Satan will, if possible, prevent them from obtaining a preparation to stand in that day. We've been getting you all week 
that this time period right here is a preparation. When Christ was in the wilderness for 40 days, was he preparing? Yes. When his preparation was finished, the devil came, right? And he tested him, right? And it was all to do with if it is written. He will so arrange affairs as to hedge up their way, entangle them with earthly treasures, cause them to carry a heavy, wearisome burden, that their hearts may be overcharged with the cares of this life, and the day of trial may come upon them as a thief. Okay, cares of this life. Jobs, family, money. Okay, we, we, we need those things. But the Lord is warning us. And do you think the Lord is going to... Every command is a promise. When the Lord says, thou shalt not covet, it's a promise. He gives you grace in order to meet that command. Never tells you to do anything that he doesn't give you the ability to do it. Every command is an enabling. You must claim those promises. So when Christ says, right, you have to prepare, and your job is preventing you from preparing, you need to go to the Lord and say, Lord, you need to give me a job that gives me time to prepare. Or you need to give me uh, some ways that are doing it where I can prepare and I can still survive. Has to be. The Lord is not, not asking you to do something and not giving you the means to do it, right? All requires choices. Choose this day whom ye will serve. Goes on to say in Desire of Ages 631, paragraph 1. Now, in unmistakable language, our Lord speaks of his second coming. And he gives warning of dangers to precede his advent to the world. So it precedes his advent. If any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before, wherefore if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, Go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers. Believe it not. For as lightning cometh forth out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. As one of the signs of Jerusalem's destruction, Christ had said, Many false prophets shall arise and deceive many. False prophets did arise, deceiving the people and leading great numbers into the desert magicians and sorcerers claiming miraculous power. So she's likening them now to magicians and sorcerers. Where did we see in the Bible magicians and sorcerers through this week? Daniel chapter 2. So when, when Nebuchadnezzar has this dream, right? He, he doesn't know God. Who did he go to? The magicians and the sorcerers. Pharaoh is another worldling, right? Worldly king. He didn't know God. Who did he go to? Magicians and the sorcerers, right? So those in the church who these deceivers are being likened to magicians and sorcerers because they are worldlings. Sister White clearly says that in the end of the 2300 day prophecy that there was two groups in the church and she calls one group this little praying company, the other group she called the world. Because they're just like the world in their practices and their habits. So it says, Magicians and sorcerers claiming miraculous power drew the people after them into the mountain solitudes. But this prophecy was spoken also for the last days. This sign is given as a sign of the second advent. Even now, false Christs and false prophets are showing signs and wonders to seduce his disciples. Do we not hear the cry? Behold, he's in the desert. Yes. We're hearing it in this movement that their people are saying they are holy and therefore Christ is in the secret chambers. That's what they're saying. Believe it not, brothers and sisters. Behold, he's in the secret chambers. This is the very claim that spiritism puts forth. But what says Christ? Believe it not, for as lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even of the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So, 
they're basically saying Christ has already come. The second coming of Christ is for them. And we know that they're already murmuring that now. But we know that right here is where this Omega Posse is going to manifest itself. They're going to not only claim to be holy, but the devil is going to give them strong delusion. That's what it says in 2 Thessalonians. In, in Isaiah chapter uh, 66, I will, I will choose their delusion. Is it 60 or 66? I will choose their delusion. 66. He says, I will choose their delusions. So based upon what you've, you've deluded yourself with, the Lord's going to give you it. And there's a nice um, story uh, in the Bible about Ahab. And he, he's invited, I think it's Hezekiah, up. And he's going to go to war with him. And he, and he wants to speak to the prophet. But <laughs> when the prophet uh, comes to him, he doesn't want to believe it. So he goes to the false prophets. And, and they, they basically said, Who, who's going to go forward? And the, the Lord says, Who, who's going to go forward and, and be a lion spirit? And one of these false angels comes forth and says, I will do it. And he sends him forth as a lion spirit. So it's all, the Lord is always allowing these things to happen. It says both good angels and fallen angels are waiting for God's command because they can do nothing unless he allows them to do it. So when Satan brings this false delusion on you, strong delusion, it's because the Lord's allowing him. He can't do any of those things, right, unless the Lord allows it. So, um, in Ezekiel chapter 8, and we looked at this, about this spiritualism, um, in verse 9 it says, and he said to me, go in and behold the wicked abominations that they do here. So I went in and saw and behold every form of creeping things and abominable beasts and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. So this is the spiritualism that they're doing. And you get down to verse 12. It says, Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the chambers of his imagery. For they say, The Lord seeth us not, and the Lord hath forsaken the earth. This is this secret chambers. This is this spiritualism that they're being manifesting right there. And it's the ancients of the house of Israel, 70 men, that's doing this. So I want us to do a comparison on this now from Romans chapter 1. We go to Romans chapter 1, verse 17. It says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Where's that taken from? Anybody know? When, when Paul says the just shall live by faith? Habakkuk, Habakkuk chapter 2. Right? He, he's, he's drawing from the Old Testament. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So this is speaking about a people, of, a people who know the truth, they've had it revealed to them, and they're holding this truth in unrighteousness. In verse 21 it says, Because that when they knew God, and you know God at your third step, they glorified him not as God. So they, they think they know God, but they don't really know God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Right? So these are the foolish virgins, and their hearts now being darkened. They received strong delusion. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. So they're proclaiming to be wise. That's the anointed ones, the ones that claim to be Christ. These are the wise. But they became fools. 
and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Where, where do we just read about birds, four-footed things and creeping things? Did we, just, we just read that. In Ezekiel chapter 8, they're in, the, they're in this secret chamber and on the walls, I'll just read it to you again, right? On the walls, all portrayed about them, behold every form of creeping things and abominable beasts and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. This is the same illustration here. The, the, the changing the image of God Right, where, where, where are images of God formed? Where do, how do we, where do we store how we understand God? In our hearts, right? In this secret chamber is their hearts. So in their hearts is every form of abominable thing. These are idols, right? And it says here in Romans 1.23, they change the glory of, of an uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man. So they're saying they're, they're men and they're making themselves like God, right? When they're really corrupted. Because it says unto birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. These are these idols that's in their hearts. And it says in Prophets and Kings 448, paragraph 3, Those who should have been spiritual leaders among the people, the ancients of the house of Israel... To the number of 70 were seen offering incense before the idolatrous representations that had been introduced into hidden chambers within the sacred precincts of the temple court. The Lord seeth us not, the men of Judah flattered themselves as they engaged in their heathenous practices. The Lord hath forsaken the earth, they blasphemously declared. Now, um, so there's two groups there's the wise and the foolish the wise are going to give a true message and their true message is that this is not Christ's second coming his second coming is here their true message says you have to go to the cross in order to get the crown their true message says the image of the beast test is here and they also say that it's the judgment of the living and, you, and during the judgment of the living, you have to confess your sin. Because the third angel's message comes here, and when the Holy Spirit comes, he does what? Convicts you of your sin. So there's something revealed about us right here that we're going to have to confess. We're going to have to be purged of our error right here as the people in October 22nd, 1844, as they entered in by faith, had to be purged of their error. They have to pass the Sabbath test, right, in order to enter into the rest, which is the latter rain. Okay, this is the true message, whereas the false message, this is the latter rain, when really it's the power of Satan. This is the second coming of Christ, saying that they're already holy and Christ is in them. You've got to get this contrast, right, between the, the true and the false. Now this next quote here, from Desire of Ages, page 628, paragraph 3 says, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. So this is putting us right here, right? At midnight. This is the sign that they're, that they're asking for. Ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. Prior to the destruction of Jerusalem, men wrestled for the supremacy. Emperors were murdered. Those supposed to be standing next to the throne were slain. There were wars and rumors of wars. All these things must come to pass, said Christ. But the end of the Jewish nation as a nation is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. All these things are the beginning of sorrows or birth pangs. The birth right here begins. Christ said, as the rabbis, right, we're going to look at this, as the rabbis see these signs. Now, who would the rabbis be in the Seventh-day Adventist church? 
ministers, leaders. And therefore, we're dealing with this movement first before we deal with the church, right? It's talking about leaders in this movement. As the rabbis see these signs, they will declare them to be God's judgments upon the nations for holding in bondage his chosen people. What is wrong with that message? Is God going to be judging the nations right here? Why not? He's not given, you know, he never punishes without a warning. That's very true. But, and and that's, a, that's a correct answer. But there's another very, very simple one. Who, who was, Patrick was going through it yesterday, the time of ignorance. Right? If it's our time of ignorance here, and this is our first and second step, and this is our third step, the time of ignorance for the Levites is here. This is their first and second steps. This will be the third step. Where are the Gentiles? What, what time is this for them? Their, their time of ignorance, right? But always in the time of it, like in our time of ignorance, was there a message came? Yes, 1996, right? But were you accountable for it? No, not until this happens, right? John 15, 20, 15, 22 says, If I had not come and spoken unto you, you would have had no sin. But now you have no cloak for your sin. So when, when this gets proven, they have no cloak for the sin. Now he can test you, right? And he's merciful. He gives you a period of probation from here to here. Then the final test comes. So the Gentiles, when they get here, do they have to get a message first that gets proven to be correct right here that brings them to their test? Yes, right? And this is the whole point of this message right here by the 144,000, the priests. They're going to give a message right there to bring them to their test. Um, okay, I'm nearly done. I'm, I'm, we're at one hour, but just a few more minutes, we'll finish. Um, as the rabbis see these signs, they will declare them to be God's judgments upon the nations for holding in bondage his chosen people. So when you hear this being given, you should know that that's false. It can't be. They will declare that these signs are the token of the advent of the Messiah. Right? They're saying, this is now marking his second coming. Be not deceived. They are the beginning of his judgments. The people have looked to themselves. They have not repented and been converted that I should heal them. They have not what? Repented. Because the third angel's message comes right here. And Sister White said it's the straight testimony. And it, it's a shaking is caused because when the straight testimony comes, it says the shaking is caused by those that rise up against the truth. Many are going to brace themselves to resist the third angel's message. Sister White says many received the first and second but refused the third. History is going to be repeated, right? Many are going to brace themselves to resist it because it says they have not repented and been converted that I should heal them. The signs that they represent as tokens of their release from bondage are signs of their destruction. This is what Patrick was saying. 9-11 was a sign of the destruction of the Seventh-day Adventist Church for spiritualism that they did on September 2001. And it's pointing forward to the Omega when this movement, a sign of their destruction comes because of this rebellion, which is spiritualism. Right? When those cities get hit right there, when those great buildings in New York come crashing down, it's not the punishment on the Gentiles, although it is affecting the Gentiles, it's their land. Because the United States is the land that was given to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It's modern-day Israel. It's the modern-day glorious land. And if you sin, God shows you many places in the Bible, that when the people sin, what happens to their land? It's cursed. It's cursed. What happened to the land? What happened to the Garden of Eden when Adam sinned? Thorns and thistles sprung forth. The curse came upon it, right? So
So when you sin, okay, here's a nice one for you. When you're faithful Seventh-day Adventists, your neighbors are protected and blessed because of you. But when you sin, they get cursed because of you. Right? So this, 9-11, was not a punishment on the world because they can't punish without a warning. It was a warning to the church about the spiritualism they did. And it's pointed to right here. And I wish we had time to go into this, but we don't. But many, many buildings and many cities are going to be brought down right here. And it's, it's frightening. You have no idea the calamities that are going to happen when they make that Sunday law. Okay, so rabbi means, um, it's, it says here when you, when you look it up in the 1848 um, Bible Dictionary, a title assumed by Jewish doctors signifying master or lord. So it's people claiming to be masters or lords over people. Are we to be lords over God's heritage? No, you're, you're not to be, right? Only, we only have one lord and one master and one rabbi, and that's Christ, right? So Matthew 23, verse 1 says, Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you, observe. That observe and do, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and they lay them on man's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all the works they do, for to be seen of men, they make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. And love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues. And greetings in the markets, and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But be not ye called Rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And in this movement right now, there are people running around saying that they're the anointed ones, they're the leaders, and you are to listen to them. And if you don't listen to them, doesn't matter what your Bible says, they're going to cast you out. How is it possible that people can sit and listen to that and not call them out? And yet many people are deceived and they are fearful of being cast out under these men. That's unbelievable, right? It's shown you that strong delusion has already fallen in measure upon God's people. And it's because they turned away from a plain, thus saith the Lord. It's your only defense, brothers and sisters. Your only defense is he thus saith the Lord. If somebody doesn't give you by two or three witnesses, then call them, call them sin by the right name. Say you are a false prophet. Call them it. Don't sit back and let them get away with it. Okay, we'll close with this quote. This is from Signs of the Times, July the 4th, 1895. Paragraph 1 and 2. Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrists. So, are we hearing that Antichrist is going to come? What, what is the message that tells you Antichrist is going to come? Which, which message? The first, second, or third? What's the message that talks about the mark of the beast? The third, right? And I'm sure we've been through this, but the first goes to here, the second goes to here, and the third arrives here, begins to be preached right here. This is what we're doing right now, 2, 16, 17. Start to give the third angel's message. It's the message that tells you the Antichrist is about to come. And all the, once I've done these presentations, all the ones we're going to look at is this manifestation of the man of sin right here. Right? You will see it. We'll be looking at this statue and all these things. So the message that tells you that Antichrist is about to come already comes beforehand because the Lord cannot punish without a warning. Who's this warning to? It's to the priests. Right? The warning's already gone out. 
Little children, it's the last time. And as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrists. Whoa! What does that tell you? It tells you when the third angel's message starts to go forth, even now, there are how many Antichrists? Many. Many Antichrists, right? Are going to come and deceive many, right? Whereby we know that it is the last time. Jesus has left us a warning upon this very point. He said, take heed that no man deceive you. So he's telling you right there that the many antichrists are these false apostles that come to you in this pleasing, bewitching manner. And shall deceive many, for there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. John continues, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. They separated from us, brothers and sisters, because they were not of us. These deceivers will come. And while claiming to be doing a special work for God, while professing to have advanced piety, to be sanctified, to see visions, and to have dreams, they will be doing the work of the enemy and be found breaking the commandments of God. We should be on our guard and bring these pretenders to the test, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. That is your test to the law and to the testimony. Nothing more. Shall we take heed to the solemn warnings of Christ, of Paul and of John upon this point? And not be deceived by the subtle devices of the enemy. For Christ has said that signs and wonders wrought by these deceivers will be so that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Amen. Shall we close with a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, just as your word has predicted already, Lord, we see many antichrists. And I pray, Lord, for great wisdom. I pray for understanding. I pray for humility in all of our hearts to make us truly realize where we are in time, to humble ourselves before you, to cry out to you now, Lord, in this time of preparation, that you will strengthen us, that you will bring to us the truth as it is in Christ Jesus, that you will fortify our hearts, Lord, that these truths might become a living and abiding principle in each one of us, that we might be doers of thy word, Lord, that you might change us from glory to glory as it is written. Lord, we can do nothing of ourselves, but you've promised us these great and precious promises that by these we might be partakers of the divine nature. Please, Lord, help us. Help us to repent, to confess all our foolishness and to turn to you with all our hearts that we might have those things fulfilled in us for your glory. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.